This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Three monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. Vsh.org. Society, of which I am president, is a nonprofit, all volunteer organization that has existed for about 11 years for the purpose of educating our community about the benefits of a vegetarian diet and the effects on human health, animal rights, and the environment of a vegetarian or a meat centered diet in Hawaii. Kathy Gogel will say a few words. She is the founding member of Animal Rights Hawaii. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. We are so delighted to have Peter Singer once again with us. He first came to Hawaii in 1979, not long after the first edition of his groundbreaking book, Animal Liberation, was published. And we are absolutely delighted to have him with us again. Animal Rights Hawaii was founded in 1977. We are a nonprofit animal advocacy organization. We welcome members. We involve ourselves in education and in litigation for animals. Um, I now have the honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Dr. Pete Singer. Tonight we are honored to have with us Professor Peter Singer, described by many as father of the animal rights movement and as the most influential living philosopher. Dr. Singer was born and raised in Australia. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in philosophy at Melbourne University there. He then traveled to Oxford University where he earned his doctorate, his PhD in philosophy and was on the faculty there. He's been on the faculties of New York University, uh, University of California, Irvine, and Monash University in Australia. Presently, he's a uh, bioethics professor at Princeton University. His publications include Animal Liberation and Writings on an Ethical Life, his latest book. These are available here tonight, and for those of you who would like to purchase them, Dr. Singer will be happy to autograph them. Tonight, Dr. Singer will present a core idea of his book, Animal Liberation, which was first published in 1975. It is widely regarded as the key text in the development of the modern animal movement. He will then consider what has happened since the book appeared and where the animal movement should go in the future. Please welcome Dr. Peter Singer. Sooner, and uh, it's great to be back. And it's great to see also uh, such a large audience, and to hear about the success of the societies, both the vegetarian society and the animal rights society, and the work that they've done. I thought that what I would do today is begin by talking about the ideas of animal liberation, and I thought I would do that by telling you a bit about how I came to start thinking about this issue in the first place and then go on to look at where we've come in the 25 years since Animal Rights Liberation was published. This year has actually um, marks 30 years that I've been a vegetarian, and for me, as I'll tell you in a moment, becoming a vegetarian and starting to think about the ethical status of animals was really more or less the same thing. And uh, for 30 years since I've become a vegetarian, and just a little over 25 years uh, since the publication of Animal Liberation. So, 
What was it that happened to me just a little bit more than 30 years ago to get me to start thinking about these issues? At that time, as, as you heard, uh, I'd studied philosophy in Australia. I'd then uh, gone to Oxford to further my studies. Uh, Oxford was then certainly seen from Australia was like the centre of the philosophical universe, it had the most renowned philosophy teachers and professors, and it was a great place to be. But my interests were, at that stage, still fairly much academic. That is, I was very interested in trying to understand a lot more about the nature of ethics, about some uh, fundamental moral principles, but I didn't really have much idea that my thinking about ethics was going to dramatically change my life. And I certainly would never have guessed that that change would have anything to do with animals or with being a vegetarian. Because uh, you know anything about Australia, you might know that as well as having kangaroos, we have a lot of cattle and a lot of sheep. Um, we're a big meat producing country, still are. And uh, growing up as a healthy young Australian lad, um, eating meat uh, twice a day or three times a day was perfectly normal. And one of the things, I remember this seems like really funny now, one of the things that my wife and I were already married by the time I went to uh, Oxford, where I thought was, you know, much as we loved Oxford, there was, there was a few things that were not so good. One was the weather. The second one was that you couldn't really get a decent cut of meat for a price that you could afford. I mean, compared to the meat in Australia, the meat in England was just really, really poor really nasty, really cheap. Well, um, really expensive, sorry, to get the good stuff. So, uh, that was the frame of mind that I was in when I came to Oxford. And I was interested in ethics, but I was interested in ethical principles about human beings. I just assumed, as I suppose most people still do, that no issues about animals could be anything like as important as issues about humans. Humans just obviously came first, which is obviously far more important than, incomparably more important really, than any non-human animals. So the change for me began more or less accidentally with a chance encounter with a Canadian graduate student um, following a class that we'd taken, and we were just talking about the topic raised in the class, which was about uh, free will and responsibility. Um, and he invited me to come back with him to his college to have lunch. Uh, all of the students were members of, of the colleges and the colleges provided meals for you. So we came back to lunch. Um, there was a choice of things that you could eat. There was a plate of spaghetti with a kind of reddish brown sauce piled on the top of it. And there was a salad plate. So my friend, new friend, uh, said, is there any meat in that sauce? And he said, was told, yes, that there is. So he took the salad plate. So I took the uh, spaghetti, it uh, felt like something a bit more substantial than a salad, and uh, sat down beside him. And uh, after we finished talking about what we were talking about, I said, so what's your problem with me? Or words to that effect. And he said, well, um, you know, I'm not, let me just pause a moment. Um, at that stage, vegetarianism was, was still you know, relatively rare. It was much, much rarer than it is now. You didn't, I couldn't particularly really remember having met or known a vegetarian before. Of course, I knew that there were vegetarians. My sense of vegetarians was that, uh, that some of them were vegetarians because of their concerns for their health, and some of them were vegetarians for more spiritual reasons. They believed in reincarnation or something like that. I associated with sort of those Eastern sorts of religions. Um, or perhaps they were some kind of uh, Quaker-like pacifist who just thought that killing was wrong, absolutely wrong, and uh, that included killing of animals. And I suppose at that stage anyway, none of those positions was particularly attractive to me. Certainly, um, the, uh, I wasn't interested in any kind of spiritual religions, and I thought that pacifism was a mistaken view. Um, I certainly you know, didn't like wars, but I certainly would have been prepared to kill, to defeat Nazism, for example, or something like that. Um, so, uh, so I asked 
friend, Richard Keshin, his name was, um, why he wanted to meet. And, and his answer wasn't to do with any of those things. It was more or less a challenge. He was saying, well, I don't know why, you know, I'm not sure what would give us the right to treat animals in the way we treat them. And I said, do you mean that, that they kill them? And he said, well, that perhaps, but not just that. Um, also the way we treat them in, in farms. Um, and I really didn't know anything about that at this stage. I had this view, which now seems to me naive, but I think was extremely common then, still less common perhaps now, but still exists, that, that animals, even though they get killed to be turned into food, and even though I could imagine that their last moments in the slaughterhouse were not very good, that they had good lives out in the fields, eating grass or doing whatever comes naturally to them before they had to get trucked away and killed. Uh, but um, Richard told me that that wasn't so, that um, while that was a traditional form of farming, now new methods that have been introduced in the name of efficiency and productivity and uh, cheaper production, that meant that a lot of animals were actually not able to roam freely around in the fields. And uh, you know, so this, this did surprise me, and I guess it did disturb me a little bit, and it started me thinking about this issue. Uh, Richard said, if you want to know more, I can introduce you to a couple of other people who know more than I do. He's actually not been a vegetarian very long himself at that stage. Um, so we talked to some other people. Uh, I got lent a book by Ruth Harrison called Animal Machines, which was the first book really to write about what was happening in the farm, in the area of farming. And so I thought, um, what I will do now is I'm going to show you some slides which will basically show you some of the things that I learned about farming, about animal farming then, just a, just a few, we've got I think nine slides, um, to give you a bit of an idea of that, and then I'll go on to talk to you about some of the ethical questions that might follow from that. So, um, let's, let's begin with the first slide. That's me. Um, this is about, this is about um, eggs as well. And, you know, I, I, I thought of hens, the hens that lay my eggs, as running around in farmyards. Um, in fact, this is much more the typical way in which the hens that lay your eggs are kept. As you see, they're indoors in a long, rather dim shed. What you can't see here, but you'll see in a moment in the next picture, is that they're also in wire cages. A different unit, obviously, is two tier. Some of them have just one tier, some of them have two tier systems. Um, they're, in, they're in wire cages. Those birds actually look a lot better. Later on, I went to see some of these places myself. Um, those birds look a lot better than many birds that you'll see. These birds, I would guess, have not been in the cages very long. Um, birds generally are kept in cages at least a year, sometimes 18 months uh, or a bit longer. Um, and by the time they've been in there for nine months or more, they've lost most of those nice white feathers that you can see. Because they're very crowded in the cages, and when they move, they rub against the wire. And the wire eventually will rub off their, a lot of their feathers. If you want to get a sense of the, uh, the size of these cages, um, they're, they're, smaller, they're smaller than that. They're standard American cage would be about 16 inches by 18 inches. Um, so, you know, measure it up on a piece of paper if you like. It's more like an ordinary sheet of typing paper than, than that. And that will hold six, usually six hens. The average, the average space per hen in the American, in American egg production is about 50 square inches per hen. So, um, 16 by 16 by 18 is a uh, space for around six hens. If you, put, if you put one fully grown hen in that area, she would still not be able to spread her wings. The wingspan of a hen is, a, is about 30 to 32 inches, depending on the size of a hen. There's, even if you take the diagonal line across a 16 by 18 inch cage, those of you can do some ge geometry, you will quickly realize it's not going to be 30 plus inches. So even if there's one bird in this cage, she couldn't stretch her wings, ever. And in fact, there's likely to be six birds in that cage. So, um, there's sort of first problem. The birds cannot make any of these natural movements. They're wire cages. 
They have wire floors, so they obviously can't build nests. There's nothing in there to build a nest with. Um, they, can't, they can't escape from other birds because if there's a more aggressive bird in the cage, then there's no way of getting away from it. In a normal farmyard situation, the, dot, the weaker birds, the subordinate birds, will learn to avoid the more dominant aggressive birds. There's no way that they can do it in these cages. But there is a solution to that problem. That problem is a, poses a danger for the farmers because um, if the birds can't get away from more aggressive birds, then the more aggressive birds might kill the weaker birds. The solution. We have the next slide. I don't know how well you can see this, especially those of you at the back, but this is not what a hen's beak normally looks like. Um, a hen's beak normally tapers to a fairly sharp point. It's a very important instrument. In fact, you know, it's really like the hands of a hen. It's what, it's what a hen does most things with. Of course, she can scratch with her feet, but, um, but the beak is her most uh, important instrument for digging in the ground, pecking at insects, and so on normally. These beaks have basically been cut off. The standard word at the time that I'm talking about when I started becoming aware of this was de-beaking. This was how the industry referred to the practice. They talked about de-beaking hens as a routine practice before putting them in a cage. After, many years after, the animal movement started to criticize the industry for de-beaking, they decided that that was not a good word to use. So this procedure is now called beak trimming, which sounds a lot more like you're just trimming your fingernails, you know. Um, but in fact, it's not at all like trimming your fingernails. Um, the beak of a hen has a lot of nerves running through it. As I say, it's how she interacts with the environment. There's a lot of nerve tissue in there. And when you cut it, you cut through the sensitive tissue. Is that the next one? And this is how you do it when they're chicks. Right? You take the chick, you put it, this is, you can't see it very well, this little machine like a guillotine, like a miniature guillotine, and the knife is hot. The knife is heated, so the hot blade cuts through the beak and it kind of cauterizes it as well. That, that prevents it getting infected. Um, this is done by people who are, who are paid by the number of chicks they process per hour, so they get very, very fast at it, um, but they don't get terribly accurate at it. Um, in the speed, often, you know, the bird's beaks can be cut off in different ways. Sometimes they can be cut off too far, sometimes, you know, they make a mistake, they cut off too much, the bird dies. But mostly, they don't die, but they still lose their beak. Now, or they lose a large part of their beak. Um, and there have been, been studies done that show that this is, actually causes continuing pain to two hens. Um, they uh, behave, the, the, their whole physiological system gets shocked when they do this, and they go off their food, their physiology slows down for a few days, and then it does pick up again, otherwise you know, they wouldn't move. But they are still sensitive, and there is some evidence that they still, even months after this event, they still have pain somewhat akin to the kind of pain people have when they have a, an arm amputated that still has phantom limb pain, because there are still nerves running through there, and uh, there's something going wrong with it. So that's, um, that's basically about egg production, but this operation also applies to the production of uh, table chickens, chicken meat or broilers. Let's have the next slide. And this is how the broilers are kept. They don't put them in cages, partly because um, you know, they don't need to, it's too uh, costly and, and uh, expensive, because these birds are bred to live only very short lives. They're bred to grow very quickly, to reach market weight, in about six or seven weeks, and then they cleared out and slaughtered. So, um, but, but they, they are deep beaks because they would also um, peck each other generally. Um, and the reason for that is, you can see there is a vast number of hens in each of, sorry, chickens, in each of these sheds. Right? There may be thousands of chickens in a single shed, some sheds as many as 10,000 chickens. Now, chickens don't have a great reputation for being smart, but in fact they're not by any means all that, all that stupid. Um, in a normal barnyard situation, a chicken can know his or her place in the pecking order in a, in a flock as big as 90 birds. So that takes a little bit of brain power to know of 90 birds whether this one is above you or below you in terms of, in terms of dominance. In other words, whether you better get out of its way or whether um, it'll get out of your way. 
But here we haven't got 90 birds, we've got thousands of birds. So the birds can't establish a normal flock. Um, they can't avoid encounters with strangers where they don't know their place in the pecking order. And, and this is a stressful situation. And um, again, they will attack each other because of this situation. And they're also db for the same purpose. What happens to chickens also happens to turkeys. We move to the next one. It's a little bit dim. Yeah, they seem a bit better without the lights, I guess. Um, this is a turkey shed. Very much the same kind of situation. So, those of you who are still eating, still eating meat, next Thanksgiving, uh, it's not too far away, think about it where your turkey has come from, whether this is something that you want to participate in. <laughs> but we're moving here to pigs. Um, I have to say that this is not an absolutely typical pig unit. Um, these are not my slides, the slides that I've been lent. Um, these show the piglets, the rearing piglets that have just been taken from their mother fairly early on in age, um, about three weeks or something like that they're weaned. Normally they would be with their mother much, much longer. Um, but uh, they've been taken from their mother partly because the sow's role, the sow's role in the production unit is to produce piglets. And if she's feeding her piglets, she's not going to come back on heat and she's not going to produce more piglets. So you take the piglets away from the mother, um, feed them artificially, and bring the mother back on heat. Sometimes you do that with hormones as well, put her back with the boar, and she's becoming productive again. That is, to the stalls in which the breeding sows are kept, but I don't have a picture of those. They are stalls which uh, measure about two feet by six feet. So they're basically just little crates around the sow. Sows are big animals. They can't turn around in a stall that narrow. They can't walk, really. They can't even walk a single step freely. They can stand up and lie down, and that's about all they do. And uh, these are very intelligent, very sensitive animals. Um, you can, you know, I've known people who've had uh, pigs as, as companion animals, and basically anything you, you can train a dog to do, you can probably train a pig to do. They're, they're just as smart as dogs. Um, and normally, they would be exploring their environment, moving around. When they become, when they're pregnant, they would be looking for nesting materials, building up a nest so that they can have the, the piglets with them, um, foraging in the forest. But basically they're kept on bare concrete in stalls with absolutely nothing to do all day except um, occasionally eat. Now, so these are the piglets in this unit. They're stacked up in cages. I've seen them more commonly in units where they're actually just on one level, but they are in bare concrete pens. And they're, they're just also inside, they're on concrete, and there's little sort of fences around them to keep them in. And perhaps the most um, shocking uh, thing that I found out at this time was about veal production, uh, which now I think probably a lot of people do know about veal production. There's been a lot of information on it. Um, this is a veal unit. It's not a very clear picture um, because it's fairly dark in veal units. Um, mostly the lights are off, even when the lights are on, so that the birds, so the uh, cows can see to eat. Um, they're pretty dim. These white plastic buckets are feeding buckets. I think they're now upside down, um, sort of draining, and when feeding time, they'll be turned the other way and um, a kind of milk replacement will be, put, will be put into the buckets. The calves are actually in little boxes, basically. They're in little stalls or boxes, and you can just see their heads protruding through the, um, through the wooden slats of the box. Uh, they've, they've also got you know, nothing to do, nowhere to go. They won't have straw for bedding because calves, if they're given straw, will eat them because they, uh, these calves are you know, fairly big now. They're not babies anymore. Um, they would normally be the age where they'd be out in the field eating grass as well, perhaps they're still suckling from their mother. Um, but they've been taken from their mother uh, extremely early on and they've been, they've been put inside and they're not given any roughing because the object of this exercise is to produce a soft, very pale, pink kind of flesh. Sometimes called white veal. It's not quite white, but it is very pale. And uh, the, um, if you give them roughage that contains iron, and if they get iron, then their flesh will turn a more rich red color, and you don't get the same price for your veal. 
So to, to maximize the price to get a veal, you prevent them from exercising. That also, of course, would give the veal, give the flesh a bit more muscle in it. You, prevent, you keep them off the grass and you deliberately make them anemic. You deliberately keep straw from them and anything else that they could get from iron. I've, I've read um, how to do it manuals for veal farmers in which they say you should check the amount of iron in the water you're feeding them because some districts, depending where you are, have water that's relatively rich in iron. If it's rich in iron, you've got to feed an iron filter and take the water, take the iron out. Because if the cows are not anemic, your left flesh will get red again. So that's uh, an out of view. We've got one more shot of the veal cows. Just move to the last slide. This is looking at it from the back. Um, and here's basically the calf really sitting there. That's all the room she's got. You can just dimly see the other wall behind her. She's, she's sitting in that fairly uncomfortable looking position because that's, um, that's essentially uh, all the room that she, or maybe it's a he. It's probably quite likely a he because these are often the surplus male cows of the dairy industry. Um, that, that he's got. Uh, you can see the crate of soil behind. Um, the crate is made of wooden slats. Now, actually, cattle hate walking on slats. Um, that's why you have cattle grids across roads. They don't go over them. But um, it's also the easiest way to just clean these things, just hose the crap through the, um, through, through the slats, and that's what happens. But they get very messy. Uh, and Probably this is an open back stall, there's no gate on the back, but don't think that means the car can get out. She probably, or he probably has a chain uh, around his neck to keep him from moving backwards or, or getting out. If not, then there'd be a barrier across the back. They're certainly not going to be allowed to wander around freely and socialise with the others. Okay, that's the end of the slide. Let's have a light up. So these are things that I learned, as I say, just about uh, 30 years ago. And uh, they were they were fairly disturbing to me, but um, as well as being, being disturbing, I guess I still wanted to think about because remember I was a philosophy student. I still wanted to think about the ethics of this. Um, what what is the situation in terms of how we ought to relate to animals? Have rights over them, if you want to put it that way, to use them or do their interests have to count, in some sense. So it was, it was like a, a puzzle. At first I was thinking of this as, as a puzzle in philosophy. Thinking, well, you know, people always do this. I, haven't, I hadn't really ever queried doing it myself. I just uh, assumed that we are entitled to use animals for food. So, how is that to be justified? How can we defend the use of animals for food? Well, I thought philosophers must have talked about this issue in the past. Let's have a look at what other philosophers have said. Um, that's obviously the, a good technique for someone. If you a student and you come across a problem, you must say, well, let's, let's look at what some of the great philosophers of the past or even those of the present have said about this issue. So I went back to look at some of the philosophers of the past, identified very much. Um, some of them was you know, just obviously not going to satisfy me. For example, if you go back to Aristotle, he says, the less rational were created to serve the more rational. We are more rational than animals, and so they exist to serve us. Incidentally, he also thought that Greeks were more rational than barbarians. And that's why he thought that slavery was okay, because this is the, the barbarians were meant to serve the more rational Greeks. A very convenient justification if you're living a comfortable life served by many slaves. But of course, it's also a very convenient justification if you're living a comfortable life using animals. But I didn't really believe that the universe was created for the sake of anyone, let alone more rational beings. That wasn't uh, where I was coming from in terms of my uh, underlying beliefs. I had and uh, have basically the view that we have evolved in roughly the manner that uh, Darwin outlined and that later evolutionary theorists have further developed. We have evolved alongside other species. There was no particular um, purpose or in this and then being created for us. In fact, they existed before us. 
So uh, I didn't accept that kind of justification. Uh, another philosopher that I looked at um, was uh, much, much admired was Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher of the 18th century. Uh, he did have a few remarks about animals. He basically said that humans are ends in themselves and animals are means to an end. Therefore, we can do what we like to animals because they exist merely as means, whereas all humans have a kind of inherent moral worth that means that you must treat them only as an end, never as a means. It's a famous principle in moral philosophy known as one formulation of Kant's categorical imperative. But, of course, while you can easily say that, uh, it's no argument just to say that humans are for ends and others, animals are means. You have to ask why that should be. And if you look further into Kant's philosophy, it was clear that he thought that rational beings or autonomous beings were the ones who were ends in themselves and all other beings were not. Now, there are a number of things that one could say about this. One thing that you could say was, well, why are rational beings the only things that are ends in themselves? Why would not um, some being that is not rational but that can still feel and still have a good life or a miserable life, perhaps depending on how you treat it, why would that not also be an end in itself? Why wouldn't it matter how we treat those beings? And Kant didn't seem to really give to me a good answer to that. But further, there was another point that occurred to me. And that is that if it's rationality that is supposed to be the test, then that's not the same as being human. I accept that, in general, human beings reach a level of rationality that surpasses that of non-human animals. I'm prepared to accept that. Uh, where all humans, or as far as I can see, all the mammals anyway in this room, no doubt as insects, seem to be humans. Um, so, uh, and I accept that you know, you're following what I'm saying, you're following a process of abstract argument. I couldn't communicate this process of argument to any non-human animal not even to a chimpanzee who would learn sign language. So in that sense, yes, we're more rational than animals as a group. But if you look at individuals, then it simply doesn't follow. There are humans who are not as rational as chimpanzees. They might not be so rational because they're, let's say, only six months old. None of us, when we were six months old, could do any of the things, well, could do many of the things that chimpanzees easily do in terms of solving puzzles and problems, learning sign language, all of those things. Secondly, uh, there are those who have had some kind of brain impairment, perhaps were born with a condition that meant that their brain would never develop normally, or perhaps had an accident at birth or shortly after birth so that their brain would never develop to the point at which they could do the things that many non-human animals can do. So if Kant was right, and it was your rationality, or perhaps your autonomy, which is dependent on your rationality because it requires your ability to choose, if that's what gives you, makes you an end in yourself, rather than a means, then it would seem that there are at least some humans who are not ends in themselves, or less ends in themselves than some animals. And this, of course, is not the way we usually think about it, not the way that I was thinking about it at the time. I was sort of, the, the basic reality is that all humans are in some morally superior category to all non-human animals. And that's why if anyone were to, uh, to, to perform the kind of experiments that we now perform on animals, on humans, even on those who were less rational than the animals that we used, most people would think that that was the wrong thing to do. They would think that that was an outrage. And yet, um, we, are, we do those things to animals. So, so that is an indication of the way in which we give superior status to all human beings. And that was the view that I had at this time and was thinking, how could it be justified? And so it became clear to me that Kant's approach would not justify this. Kant's approach might justify something rather different which gives some special status to rational beings if you could defend that premise, but it would never justify the kind of morality that we have and work on every day. 
Well, apart from Aristotle and Kant, what else was there? There was one among the great ancient philosophers, or not so ancient I guess, but you know, of Kant's vintage roughly, who had taken a different approach to this issue. And this happened to be an approach that I was in any case already fairly sympathetic with. And that was the utilitarian view, utilitarian ethic, basically the ethic that says you should consider the consequences of what you should do, what you do, and in a classical view, what this means is you should consider whether your actions are going to increase happiness and reduce suffering. That's the basic test of a good act. A good act will do the most possible to increase happiness or net of any suffering that it causes or to reduce misery. And Bentham actually, Jeremy Bentham, who was the person I'm thinking about, who was the founding father of this view, writing at the end of the 18th century, actually had a footnote that uh, was not terribly well known then, become somewhat better known since, to one of his works, in which he refers to the fact, he's writing just after the French Revolution and after the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, had abolished the uh, abolished slavery in France and the French dominions. Um, and so Bentham was saying, supporting this view, he's saying, the French have already discovered that the blackness of the skin is no reason to abandon one sensitive being to the caprice of another. Perhaps one day we shall realize that, and here he used a few things that refer to animals, that, um, that the, vel the velocity of the skin, he talks about the thickness of the skin, or the termination of the os sacrum, this is an anatomical difference between humans and animals, is also no reason to abandon a sensitive being to its tormentor. And then he goes on to say, the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And this struck a chord with me. I mean, yes, Kantians may talk a lot about reason, but surely what's really fundamental not the only thing that matters, but really fundamental, really the bottom line in terms of does it matter how you treat another being is this question, can it suffer? If it can suffer, then you can harm it. You can do things that are wrong to it. And if you can do things that are wrong to it, then it can't just be a means to our ends. It has ends of its own. It is an end in itself, in, in Kant's terminology, because um, it would like to avoid suffering would like to get out of that suffering. So, from that point, I guess, I began to think, well, maybe there is really something wrong going on here. Maybe it's not a question of how do I justify the present status quo, but it's an issue of how do I change so that this status quo no longer exists, so that, so that I do something to perhaps help to make other people think, question about whether this really is the way that we ought to treat animals. And so, I thought about it, I talked to my wife about it, if you're thinking about these issues, it's great to have someone else to talk to who is also fairly open-minded. And we came to the conclusion, firstly, that, as I said, you, you couldn't really justify the treatment of animals. And secondly, that that was not only a philosophical conclusion, that was not only a matter of theory that you can write papers about, but particularly in the light of the sorts of things that I showed you in the slides a little while ago, this is something that calls on each of us to act differently. Because if those ways of treating animals that I showed you are wrong, and if animals can't as ends in themselves, then surely they are wrong. Then we shouldn't be supporting them. But if we go down to the supermarket and buy the products of those methods of farming, that's all the support that it needs. The producers, the people who produce the veal and the chicken and the turkey and the eggs that way, they don't need us to send them little notes telling them how terrific they are, or to say in opinion polls that we think everything that farming does is wonderful. They need us to buy their products. 
That's all they need us for, and it's also everything that they need us for. Without that, they're out of business. So, if you don't think that that's the right way to treat animals, then you ought not to be buying it. And the other thing that I guess made us think about think about this as an essential first step was that it was fairly easy to, to realize even then, I mean there's a huge amount more literature on it now, but even then it was fairly easy to know that you didn't have to eat um, animals in order to be healthy, in order to live a healthy life. Um, in fact there's a lot of evidence, and there's plenty of it on the tables behind you, that you're going to live a healthier life if you don't eat animals, or if you don't eat, even if you don't eat animal products at all. But that wasn't the point that I was thinking about at the time. Um, all I wanted to know is that I could be at least as healthy as I was without any of these products. And it didn't take very long, even then, back in 1971, it didn't take very long to see that that was obviously so. There was a vegetarian society in Britain that had been going for, I can't remember exactly, but I would say roughly 100 years, something like that, certainly a long time. There were third generation vegetarians that I met um, around Oxford. Uh, so it was clearly um, a, an adequate diet, and for anyone living in a major urban developed society, there was just a huge range of alternatives to eating meat that you could find. It was not a problem. Now, you know, yes, it might have been different. I mean, I always get the question coming up from audience as well. You know, suppose that you're an Eskimo. Suppose that you're an Australian Aboriginal living in the desert, somewhere like that. Suppose that you're um, one of the Bushmen of the Kalahari. You know, what would you do then? Well, I guess if I was one of those people, and if I was still living a traditional life, I would still be eating meat because we'd perhaps not have any alternatives. But I'm not, and I don't think any of you are. Um, so we all have this choice. We have the choice that the society provides us with, with a wide range of healthy and palatable foods to substitute for the animal foods that I was eating. So it was, it was a fairly easy thing to do. And from that point, uh, uh, my wife and I were rapidly uh, became vegetarians, and as I say, that's now been going on for 30 years. And uh, those of you who are interested, we have three daughters who are all now in their 20s who have also been vegetarians from, uh, from birth and, uh, and are doing very well, thank you. Okay, that's about the four ideas, I think, of animal liberation. I'm happy to develop them a little bit further in questions. Um, essentially, so let me say one, one or two more sentences about it. Essentially, the idea that I hold is that animals have interests, beings, beings that can suffer, as I said, have, an in, have interests, they may be able to do more things than just not suffer, of course. That's not the only interest they have. But they have at least an interest in not suffering. And if they have an interest in not suffering, we ought to give that interest the same weight that we give to similar interests that humans have. So humans also have interest in not suffering. And we should not discount the interest of animals just because they're not members of our species. That's an attitude of prejudice. To say it's not a member of our species, therefore I'm not as much concerned about its suffering, is a prejudice against beings that are not members of our species. That, in broad logical form, is akin to those other prejudices that we're much more familiar with prejudices like racism against those who are not members of our race, sexism against those who are not members of our sex, and so on. So, you know, we're familiar with those, we're familiar with how those ideologies work. We've studied them, they've been what was written about them. We also know how easy it is for people to try and find what we now regard as spurious ideological justifications for them, like the one by Aristotle that I mentioned, like the very common defense of slavery in the United States that uh, the children of Ham were given to, to us as their servants and the children of Ham are the Africans and so on. So there's religious justifications, there's uh, other, you know, other kinds of philosophical justifications. Just as people will sometimes quote from Genesis to say that we were given dominion over the animals and so on. Um, but I think these are all, should all be seen as attempts to rationalize what we like to do. Animals are convenient, walking parcels 
of, uh, of calories that we can eat. Uh, sure, in earlier times when we needed, when it was a struggle just to get enough calories to survive, um, you know, we, we, we got used to eating them, so um, then we, we have a taste for them, we continue to eat them. It's convenient, but we rationalize that in a whole variety of ways. And I think these should all be seen as rationalizations just like the rationalizations that we have for racism. So, uh, that is really, as I say, that that's really the core, the core ideas of my book that led me to, to uh, think about that issue, to write about it, and uh, after a few years to write Animal Liberation. Now, let me then talk a little bit about that, because people now say, well, it's 25, 25, 26 years since Animal Liberation was published. What do you think of the progress that's been made since then? And you know, sometimes I say, well, what progress exactly are you referring to? Um, but of course, you can measure progress in, in different ways, and I don't want to—I don't want to be totally negative about it. Uh, yes, there is a big animal rights movement. Uh, around the world, really, and you find it, you know, I've traveled a bit, I've spoken to groups in a whole range of different countries, uh, around the Americas, Australia, throughout Europe, even though it's smaller in parts of Asia, animal liberation has now been translated into Japanese, into Korean, and even into Chinese, even not just Taiwan, but it's been published in uh, People's Republic of China. Um, so, you know, the ideas are getting, are getting around, and there is a movement where there was no movement before, and that's important. Also, clearly, vegetarianism is, as I was saying, much more common and much more respected than it was then. At the time that uh, I became a vegetarian, remember I was living in Oxford, which those of you don't know the geography, is just about an hour, a little bit over an hour on the train from London. Uh, Oxford had no vegetarian restaurant at the time. It had a health food shop, you could get something for lunch, but it had no vegetarian restaurant. London had just two, and their names were significant. One was called The Nut House, <laughs> and the other was called Frank's. And I think those names, you know, self deprecating, sure, but those names indicate the way that people thought about vegetarians at the time. I have no idea how many vegetarian places there are in London now, but there's certainly a lot. And in fact, after the recent uh, mad cow disease and foot and mouth disease, uh, uh, it's even skyrocketed further now than it was just a, a couple of years ago. Uh, so those things are changing dramatically. In fact, not only in, not only in England and not only in this country, where there's also just a lot more vegetarian food around, most surprising of all, I read something uh, about Paris. Now, those of you who have been vegetarians in France, especially if you've been vegetarians for a few years, will know that to go into a, a good French restaurant and say, I'm a vegetarian, is a little bit like saying, would you bring me the French flag so that I can urinate on it, please? <laughs> it's, it's, it's just considered as if you're insulting the greatest glory of French culture, the French cuisine. Now, even that, even that has started to change. And there is animal liberation now a group, an animal anti-species group in France, but one of France's leading French chefs, who runs a restaurant called La Pêche, has transformed the menu of that restaurant, and it gets the three Michelin hats, which is like the highest accolade of French cooking, has transformed the menu into a virtually vegetarian menu. Not, it's not quite, not quite pure about it, there's a little bit of fish, a little bit of poultry, but most of the, most of the menu is actually vegetarian. And what he says he's trying to do is to restructure French cuisine in a, in a different way. So, good luck to him, I hope he succeeds. But uh, all of these things are certainly, are certainly in progress. Um, but the real question we need to ask is, is how do they affect the animals? How much difference has this made to the animals? Well, just the fact that there are a larger number of vegetarians and vegans certainly makes a difference because they are not giving their money to the farmers, to the producers, and therefore there are fewer animals going through the kind of suffering 
that uh, you see there. At least fewer animals in those countries that have significant numbers of vegans. Unfortunately, in tandem with this, as some other nations become more affluent, particularly Asian nations, they are starting to eat more meat. Um, they're starting to copy our Western eating style, which I think is a total disaster in every way. A disaster in health terms, a disaster in environmental terms, and of course a disaster for the animals. And given the population of China and the increasing affluence of China, you know, which is in itself a good thing, you know, it's great when a country that is, has millions of very poor people becomes a little bit better off, but it's a tragedy when it leads them to want to eat more meat. So in terms of meat production, meat consumption in the world as a whole, even though it may have leveled off to some extent in uh, the developed countries, even fallen in some, um, where it's rising elsewhere, it's more than making up for that, unfortunately. But what about these kinds of ways of treating animals that I've been talking about? Let me just uh, say a little bit about some of those things. If we were to look at the United States, for example, I would have had to say, if I was giving this talk a year ago anyway, just 30 months ago to be very precise, um, I would have had to say there has been no progress at all for American farm animals. I'll tell you why I can't quite say that now, though I could very, very nearly say that now. No progress in moving away from the conditions that I described to you that existed 25 years ago. Not a single step, really, in improving the lot of those farm uh, animals. But let me turn to somewhere where the news is a little bit brighter before I come back to the United States. In Europe, generally, there have been quite significant changes, and this is very positive. When I first got to the time I was telling you about when I was in Oxford, when I became a vegetarian, as well as becoming a vegetarian, I wanted to do something reasonably active. There was a small organization called Compassion in World Farming that existed then. I contacted them, said I'd like to do something. Uh, they said, well, we've got some uh, demonstration models of what these cage, what hens in cages, what the hen cages look like and what the veal cows in, in uh, stalls look like so that people can see them because although as I said Ruth Harrison had written this book, it was published by a very small publisher, it wasn't widely known. So I said, fine, uh, I and my friends, the other people that I mentioned, will book a prominent little square in Oxford, in the centre of the main shopping street, and, um, and we'll, we'll set up these displays and hand out some information. People can, can join you. So a guy came up with a little, uh, a little truck, and uh, on the back of it there was kind of a veal crate like the ones you saw there, and there was a car in it except it wasn't a real calf, of course, it was a, a stuffed calf made out of felt with those sort of nice brown and white patches, but looked pretty real. And there were cages, you know, exactly the real cages the hens are in, with uh, kind of paper mache hens in them. Again, fairly good. In fact, um, one lady came up to me when I was handing out leaflets and said, it's cruel for you to put those hens out here in this busy street, they won't like it. Now, but the thing about that, the thing that uh, why I mentioned it, was that um, I remember clearly someone else coming up to me and saying, you know, look, I don't, you know, I don't approve of that, but you realize you're taking on the whole of the farming industry here. You know, this is a huge industry. I don't know how many tens of millions or hundreds of millions of pounds uh, was producing a year, but this is a big industry, politically very well connected. You know, um, how are you really going to fight this kind of industry when there's you know, half a dozen of you and there's this other tiny little group over there and so on. We were, we were very small. Um, we you know, had, had no money to do this sort of stuff. And uh, so basically they said, look, you know, it's just, it's just economics. If this is a cheaper way to produce meat and eggs, then that's what's, that's what's going to happen. You can't stop it. Well, I'm delighted to say that actually that guy was wrong. It's that after many years' hard work, in which Compassion and World Farming grew and became one of the more influential players, but joined by many other organizations in the rest of the European Union, because in Europe now, in the European Union, you've got 15 member nations, and there's not, not a lot of point in 
banning one method of agriculture in one country, if you ban, let's say, the real trade in Britain, which did actually happen, that still makes it possible for uh, imported veal from that exact method of production to be produced in, in Holland, let's say, which is a big veal producer, just to be sent over. So in a way it doesn't achieve a whole lot under those circumstances. Because the veal crates that you saw there have already been banned in Britain for quite a long time, and uh, they are also being phased out in the European Union. I couldn't show you the sow stalls, um, stalls in which the pregnant sows are kept, they have now been banned in Britain for um, two years and they will also be phased out in Europe with the exception of uh, farmers will be, producers will be permitted to use them for a four week period only. My guess is that they probably find it not worth having them just for a four week period. And are now, at least as far as the food animals are concerned, basically. I, I could go on for a long time, I could talk about animal experimentation or furs or the treatment of companion animals. There are many other topics that animal liberation is concerned with. But um, for me, the food issue is the most important because it affects by far the largest number of animals. And there are a lot of animals used in experimentation, of course. Exact figures are hard to come by because the USDA doesn't even count rats and mice, doesn't even keep statistics on them, which are the, uh, the largest numbers of animals used. But it may be 20 million, it may be 30 million, it may be 40 million animals are used in experiments each year in the United States. That's a high figure, you know, translated into think how many animals are being used each day. But still, compared with the number of animals being killed for food in the United States each year, it's just tiny, because we are talking about a figure of around 10 billion animals. The last USDA, USDA statistics shows that 10 billion animals are killed for food each year in the United States. The have been very attentive. Um, I'm sure some of you will have questions. Uh, I want to stop talking now and turn it over to you. Thank you very much. The liberation we've been received in the philosophical community. Um, well, I think the, to me, what's most important and in a way most satisfying is that there is now a philosophical debate and discussion about the treatment of animals where there was none 25 years ago. So that you know, if, you, if you type animals and ethics into um, a, you know, the, the, an online sort of search thing for philosophy journals, you will get lots of hits now. You'll get lots of articles that discuss the ethics of treatment of animals by professional philosophers. And there are anthologies that have collected them. I've collected some of them myself in a work I did with Tom Regan called Animal Rights and Human Obligations. In thousands of courses around the world, students of philosophy are being taught this subject. They're being taught about this subject. They might be being taught by someone who thinks that everything that I've said tonight is wrong. But that's, the, the subject is still there. The topic is being raised. They're being made to think about it. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a non-profit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Three monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344 or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.